Welcome to News Wrap Local. I am your host, Justin Chapman. After providing a few brief updates on this month's local stories, we'll speak with our guest, Craig Washington. Craig is a future president of the Tournament of Roses Association. We'll ask him how the pandemic has impacted the tournament, plans for upcoming rose parades, and more. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Briefs. Pasadena's Design Commission has approved the final design review application on a proposed futuristic-looking laboratory building at Caltech. Commissioners voted unanimously on the recommendation to approve the application subject to conditions requiring further review. A final design review approval is required prior to filing for a building or a site development permit. The proposed 80,000 square foot building will be placed in the same location as the existing Mead Laboratory. The approved design involves the demolition of the Mead Laboratory and the removal of 37 trees. The project also involves reconfiguring existing open spaces to the south, west and north of the proposed new building to make way for the creation of outdoor classroom space and a new amphitheater with a shade structure. The Design Commission has agreed to form a subcommittee that will review a mock-up of the project prior to construction. The Pasadena Unified School District Board of Education unanimously passed a resolution authorizing Superintendent Dr. Brian McDonald to resume emergency powers as the PUSD continues to deal with the ongoing pandemic. The resolution allows the superintendent to take any and all actions necessary to ensure the continuation of public education and the health and safety of the students and staff. According to the resolution, it authorizes the superintendent at any time to declare the necessity to close a school site or a classroom to in-person instruction or halt any in-person service provided by the district as needed to respond to health conditions. The superintendent will also be able to move the district from in-person to remote instruction if need be. The resolution, effective immediately, will remain in force unless Governor Newsom overrides any part. The LA County Department of Health declares COVID-19 no longer a public health threat or the resolution's current expiration date of June 30th, 2022 is reached. California's drought has forced new water conservation measures here in Pasadena. To encourage water conservation during the state's current ongoing drought, Pasadena is implementing a new watering schedule effective immediately. Under the new water shortage plan, residents are restricted to outdoor watering just two days per week from April to October and one day per week from November to March. Even numbered street addresses are limited to watering on Mondays and Thursdays, while odd numbered street addresses are limited to Tuesdays and Fridays. The City Council unanimously approved the water schedule on Monday, August 16th, to align the city with the state's water reduction target. In addition to restrictions on watering days, local leaders will continue ongoing education through signage and social media posts that are already in the works. The hope is that incentive programs will encourage water conservation. Thank you for tuning in. Pasadena City Council has been dark for most of the past month and just met again on Monday, where they tabled the first reading of the amended retail cannabis ordinance and received a presentation on the city's acquisition of the 710 freeway stub. Let's turn now to our lightning round of news updates. One, the city of Pasadena now wants to get reimbursed the roughly $450,000 it spent to fight what it called the Tournament of Roses Association's quote unquote baseless litigation, most of which was dismissed by a court recently related to the tournament's ability to move the Rose Bowl game in case of a situation like COVID, as it did earlier this year. After the judge ruled against all but one of the tournament's counts, alleged trademark infringement, unfair competition, false association, slander and false advertising, but not the force majeure clause because the judge didn't want to speculate whether another such situation would occur. The tournament claimed that they achieved their main goals and then appealed the ruling to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Opening briefs for the appeal are due by November 18th. Then the city has until December 20th to respond and that process could take up to a year to resolve. So that could delay any reimbursement to the city of attorney fees. 
Two, preliminary data from the 2020 census released by the federal government indicates that Pasadena's population grew slightly to 138,699, which is an increase of 1,577 people compared to the 2010 census. The final official census data currently being reviewed by the state of California will be released any day now in late September. Three, the Pasadena Human Relations Commission voted to support the proposal by the group Pasadenans Empowering Parent Participation in Education Governance, calling for the City Council to amend the City Charter to allow all non-citizen parents of Pasadena Unified School District students to vote in school board elections. In July 2020, the PUSD Board rejected a similar proposal about whether to give PUSD voters the opportunity to decide this issue for themselves. Meanwhile, PUSD has begun testing all staff and students for COVID who are not vaccinated, but ran out of tests last week. PUSD has also suspended the release of quarantine numbers of students and staff with confirmed cases of COVID. And the board unanimously voted to authorize resuming Superintendent Dr. Brian McDonald's emergency powers during the pandemic. Four, a number of restaurant and retail sto store owners in Pasadena have begun implementing the nation's first face pay network which allows customers to pay via facial recognition devices as a hands-free alternative to cash, credit cards, or Apple Pay. Five, 86.7% of Pasadenans over the age of 12 have been vaccinated against COVID-19 as of Tuesday, according to the Pasadena Public Health Department. 94.4% have received at least one vaccine dose. Well done, Pasadena. Six, city manager Steve Mermel said the city will soon receive $4 million from the state to pay for the design and drawings for the seismic upgrades of Pasadena Central Library, which was closed in May after a structural assessment found that the historic building's unreinforced masonry would be unsafe in an earthquake. Seven, starting next month, people placing phone calls within the 626 area code will need to dial the full 10 digit number, including the area code, when making local calls. The move comes as the nation will adopt 988 as the number to reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by July 16th, 2022. Eight, the Huntington Library, Art Museum and Botanical Gardens has commissioned the renowned Senegalese artist Kahindi Wiley to create a new work inspired by Thomas Gainborough's The Blue Boy, which was painted circa 1770 and is one of the Huntington's most well-known pieces of art. Wiley was the artist who painted President Barack Obama's official portrait, which hangs in the Smithsonian's Nat National Portrait Gallery and depicts Obama sitting on a chair among green foliage. And nine, as I reported in Pasadena Now recently, the lawyer for Sirhan Sirhan, who was convicted of assassinating Sen Senator Bobby Kennedy at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles in 1968, told me that if he gets paroled and released, he plans to live with his brother in, here in Pasadena. Sirhan Sirhan was a PCC student at the time of the shooting. A two-member parole board recently re recommended his release, and that decision is currently being reviewed by the full parole board before final approval is decided by California Governor Gavin Newsom, who just handily defeated a recall attempt against him this week. Kennedy's wife, Ethel, now 96 years old, and six of their nine living children said Sirhan Sirhan should not be paroled, while two of their children support his release. Let's patch in our guest, Craig Washington. Craig, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Justin, for the opportunity to, to join your show. Appreciate it. Craig has been a volunteer member of the Tournament of Roses Association since 2000 and will serve as the association's president in 2029. He will provide leadership for the 140th Rose Parade and 115th Rose Bowl game on January 1st, 2029. His daughter, Drew Washington, served as the 2012 Rose Queen. Craig is a licensed certified public accountant and California real estate broker. He currently serves as regional contract manager for Jacobs Engineering Group, one of the largest technical services companies in the world. A few years ago, I served with Craig on Pasadena's Northwest Commission when he was the chair of that commission. So, so Craig, uh, you're the future president of the Tournament of Roses. Tell us about your, your journey in this organization and, and tell us about the, the commitment that volunteers make to work their way up to leadership. Well, Justin, thank you for, for asking. Uh, but before I, I launch into that, I'd like to give some, some due respect to my current leadership, uh, Dr. Robert Miller 
uh, who is serving as the president and chairman of the board of the 2022 Passionate Tournament of Roads Association. Uh, he'll be providing leadership for the 133rd Rose Parade and 108th Rose Bowl game held on January 1st, uh, 2022. And just give you a little bit about his theme. You know, Miller announced uh, his theme as Dream, Believe, uh, Achieve uh, as, as the, the theme for the Passion Tournament of Roses Parade. And it's celebrating education and its ability to open doors, open minds, and change lives. Uh, Bob is a strong believer that education paves the path to success with the world of opportunities achieved through knowledge, compassion, and determination. As he states, education is the great equalizer. So I wanted to be able to give that opportunity to share our current leadership's uh, theme, uh, his story, and he will be announcing his grand marshal on October 5th. Great. So with that, you discussed about uh, uh, my entree uh, into the Tournament of Roses. Um, you know, currently I'm, I'm serving as the vice president uh, of the Tournament of Roses, and I've been a member since 2000. And I was impacted by joining uh, by a local African-American business leader. You know, I was searching for a role to play in the community and, and support uh, in developing the success that I was having in the community. And at that time, the tournament was looking for participation from, for young African-American businessmen. So I, I felt that this would be a good match. And ironically, uh, the year uh, 2000 was a year prior to 9-11. So as you can imagine, the year following uh, was the beginning of a change that is still affected uh, 20 years later and uh, the impact it has had. And, and we will never, never, never forget. Uh, with that said, you know, my journey started uh, like all of the volunteers in the Tournament of Roses. Um, we serve uh, uh, on what we call the big three, our first six years, representing the formation area, which is the pre-parade organizing, parade operations, which takes the parade down the parade route, and the post-parade area, which represents the float viewing of the parade. Uh, so it's been a, a, a tremendous opportunity uh, to be able to start in that arena because we all start as equal. Uh, and we all, no matter your background, no matter your profession, no matter your upbringing. Uh, so that is one uh, uh, equalizer within the Tournament of Roses. But with that, each year, 800 excuse me, 80,000 hours of combined hours of supply by the 935 members. Um, we're nicknamed, we're nicknamed as the white suiters because of the distinct white suits that every, every man, woman uh, wears during that particular time. Uh, these are community spirited men and women. They give up their evenings, weekends and holidays to ensure the success of the Rose Parade and the Rose Bowl game. You know, currently there's 31 operating committees. Every two years you rotate through one of those operating committees. So you're either in the planning stage, the operating stage, or serving on executive leadership, which I currently serve on. To get to the, to the stage of executive leadership, you're, you're, you're looking at a 25 to, to 20 to 30 year uh, commitment uh, within the association. Mm -hmm. um, as serving as a vice chair of the association, you may serve that period of time as four to six years, uh, and you would serve as a chairman for eight to 10 years. Right, and um, uh, in the year uh, leading up to 2029, uh, the, the Olympic games will be going on in, in Los Angeles in 2028. Uh, so have you have you uh, thought about your theme and your plans for that year, or, or is it till, uh, still too far out? Well, you know, it, 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 is, it is a little far out. You know, I, I will be serving as the president in 2029. You know, that, that does seem like a, a, you know, light years away for some. Uh, so I will be providing the leadership. It will be the 140th Rose Parade and the 115th Rose Bowl game, which will be on January 1, 2029. And as you indicated, uh, Los Angeles will be hosting uh, the world, the LA 2028 Olympics. Thus, the eye will definitely be on this region during that summer. Uh, and the world will, bound, will have bound to change by that time. But one thing is certain that you can be sure that I will be providing on New Year's Day 2029. I will provide the entire world an opportunity to turn its attention to Pasadena, the home of the Rose Parade 
and the home of the Rose Bowl game. And it's been celebrated for over 100 years. And we will be celebrating New Year's celebration and all the festive flowers, music, and sports that's unequaled anywhere in the world. That's one thing that's certain in 2029. Right. And, um, the, you know, the tournament has come a long way in terms of increasing diversity in the organization. Tell us a little bit about that journey, some of the history from the early 90s and, and the creation of the at-large members of the executive committee and the, the progress that has been made in this area in recent years. All right. Thanks, Justin. Yes, that has uh, been uh, 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 a bit of a history of the association. So since uh, the association inception, in 1895, the Turner Rose has been bringing, been about bringing people together. And the members care deeply about Pasadena and the surrounding communities and believe our region is beautiful, strong because of our people and who come from all different backgrounds and walks of life. You know, however, you know, its leadership was not reflecting the richness of all of its members. So in the early 90s, led by legendary community leaders, Jimmy Bakewell and uh, Jimmy Morris and Danny Bakewell, they along with other community leaders challenged the Tournament of Roses Association to make policy changes, to incorporate a greater diverse leadership in its executive leadership team. And with that, it did lead the association to implement change in its leadership diversity policy with the addition, as you've indicated, the at-large member to the executive committee, which was a policy established in 1993. And its stated goal was to strive to have the makeup of the executive committee reflect the diversity of the association's membership and the Pasadena area population as a whole. At-large members of the executive committee were to be ethnically and gender-wise diverse and were to serve a two year period of time. And it's very interesting, Justin, because out of that, uh, uh, that policy, uh, the association's first African-American president came from that inaugural class, Gerald Freeney, thus bearing the fruit, the fruit from the passionate commitment of the community service of Bakewell and Morris. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, but what I'd like to say, though, it yeah. didn't end it because 30 years later, here we are. We're a more diverse leadership than ever. Mm -hmm. The Passing and Terminal Rose Association is committed to being an excellent community partner. And its ideas that we are better together. One of the tenets of our community outreach efforts. And recently, to further foster this belief and commitment, a better together policy initiative was developed. And it's a refreshed engagement strategy that is aligned with the association's strategic goals and objectives and initiatives that build on the work that we have done as a long-standing community partner. If I may add, the association mm -hmm. is committed to being better together. And what we have developed are three pillars to advance this better together initiative. And if I might, share those sure. social justice and equity excuse me social justice and education such as convening community dialogues to encourage discussion and understanding of issues revolving around race and social equity and diversity a second pillar economic inclusion helping close the educational equity gap and third community partnerships we're hoping to align our resources of the association and its partners with needs that fulfill the community needs. We feel that this new refreshed Better Together initiative will further advance the, the tournament's commitment to the Pasadena and surrounding areas. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's important, I think, for the community to, to know that history and, and to, to know uh, about that progress uh, in recent years. Um, so tell me about how the pandemic has impacted the, the tournament um, and, and you know, where, where do things stand right now? Will, will there be a parade this coming January 1st? Will it look different than previous years? Where are things at right now? 
Well, first of all, yes, absolutely. There will be a parade that go, goes down Colorado Boulevard on January 1. You know, how will it look different? It will not look different than any of the parades that you've seen in the past. We know last year we did a TV special in order, in order to keep everyone safe because that is the Tournament of Roses' first priority, the safety of its members and its participants. Um, the only exception this year, unfortunately, are international bands due to the travel restrictions will, will be unable to participate this year. Um, but other impacts, it has been challenging with the COVID uh, and the association. You know, so we've made some policy changes and, and, and I, if I could share with you, we've taken this very seriously and spent a lot of time. And beginning January 15th uh, in 2021, all the Tournament of Roses volunteers and associated volunteers will be required to have a COVID-19 vaccine and be fully vaccinated before entering the tournament house for meetings, events, and other activities for the remainder of the association's fiscal year, April 2022. In addition, the 2022 Rose Parade participants who will be attending indoor and in-person meetings, events, and other activities will also be required to have a COVID-19 vaccine and be fully vaccinated before attending any of these events that we will be hosting. So we take the we take the the, the health and safety of our of our members and our participants very seriously. Thus, we've instituted a policy that we think is 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 appropriate to have vaccination for all that are participating in our events. Mm -hmm. um, great, thank you. And, and and part of the impact, obviously, from the pandemic is that the uh, the uh, Rose Parade was canceled this past year. The the Rose Bowl game. Uh, was uh, moved to to Texas to be played there, which of course sparked this lawsuit between the, the tournament and the city. I, I'm sure there's not much you can you can say about that lawsuit, but but can you give us a quick rundown? Like, what can you tell us about what that was about, and and what are the next steps in the process? As you are clearly correct, uh, Justin. It is pending pending litigation that's taken place uh, on this matter, but there has been a lot you know publicly uh, written uh, that you know a lot of the public has read about. And I can only say that, you know, we have family members uh, seeking to gain clarity of a, a prior understanding. Uh, and, and it's not about moving the Rose Bowl game out of Pasadena Rose Bowl Stadium. It's not about that. It's never been about that. And the Rose Bowl game will forever be in that stadium. And, and, and tell us a little bit about uh, the, the tournament's legacy in Pasadena and why it's so important to this, this community. And, and just some thoughts uh, quickly on, on what the future of the tournament looks like. Justin, that, I, I appreciate you sharing that because that's that's something that uh, I feel that the community needs to, may have a little more light set on and, and we need to kind of, you know, beat our drum a little a little more. I just want to share with you some of the, the, the commitments and the contributions that the Passing and Tournament Roses provides. You know, every year the Rose Bowl game contributes approximately $75 million of educational university support to the Big Ten and the Pac-12 universities throughout the country. Annually, the Passing Tournament Roses generates nearly $200 million of economic impact in the Southern California region. That's huge. To date, the past and the of Roses has contributed more than $1.3 billion, that's a B, to American colleges and universities in support of higher education and collegiate athletics. Over the next 10 years, we will be contributing another $1 billion to colleges and universities throughout the country. Those are large dollars of contribution that this association brings about its members to put on efforts to support the community. And last but not least, the Passing and Terminal Roads Association annually donates nearly $600,000 to organizations and individuals throughout the greater Pasadena area. That contribution cannot be sneezed upon or go lightly. We make a tremendous impact to nonprofits and to organizations throughout our community and we consistently support the educational uh, endeavors throughout all of our use throughout our community. So the future looks bright and we continue to be servants to our community, hopefully for the next 100 years. 
Well, Craig, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you providing us with your, your insights on this. Thank you for having me and uh, much success to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1891 that Pasadena philanthropist Amos Troop rented the Worcester Block Building, which still stands on the northeast corner of the intersection of Fair Oaks and Green Street in Pasadena for the purpose of establishing Troop University, a forerunner to Caltech. In November of that year, Troop University opened its doors with 31 students and a six-member faculty. The campus was moved to a site bordered by Raymond Avenue to the west and Chestnut Street to the south near St. Andrew's Church, and the name was changed to Troop Polytechnic Institute in 1893. In 1910, architects Elmer Gray and Myron Hunt built Troop Hall on its present site, and the name changed to Troop College of Technology in 1913, and then finally to the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, in 1920. The old campus buildings were demolished in the 1920s, and Caltech went on to become one of the most prestigious science and technology universities in the world. One of many institutions that this city can be proud of. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of News Wrap Local. I'm Justin Chapman, signing off. Tune in every third Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PassionMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Sign up for my monthly email newsletter to get updates on what I'm working on by visiting JustinChapman.Substack.com. See you again next month.